Hotep Senuhena Senut Etiren Isha Kandugu Kemet. I hope you're doing well. I just noticed that the title was not in full. So I've just uh, made the correction. All right. So the full title of this video is Dr. Campbell's Critic of the Origin of the Word Amen, Ancient Knowledge the Bible Has Never Told. Okay. Let me check the sound first. The Bible has never told. That's beautiful. All right. So you have the book cover. The thumbnail for this video shows um, also the uh, leather book cover. So, first thing first. <laughs> I want to show you some song. I wish I want to show you a little some song. The plagiarizer has been claiming to be a linguist, but doesn't hold any degree in linguistic whatsoever. He will do a critic of Campbell's article. I will review Campbell's article. Dr. Campbell, PhD in linguistics. So the plagiarizer, Asar Imhol Fek, Asar Imhol Fek, has this uh, live stream coming up in eight days. And this is what he wrote here. Let's, let's have a look together. Okay, make it even larger. There it is. So he wrote, join me on Kumba Friday, August 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern time at the Mongi as we do another workshop on how to critique the critique. In this episode, we will be analyzing a critique made by Obadele Kumbo, PhD, in his paper, Editorial Book Critique. The origin of the word Amen, ancient knowledge the Bible has never told, 2020. This paper is a critique of the book of the same title, but the 2020 second edition, written by Drs. O. Kwame Osei, Jahi Issa, and Salim Faraji. Why Campbell made some valid critiques of this text? There are many mistakes, procedural and ethical issues of the critique that diminished its quality and potential to advance the conversation. We will address those issues and demonstrate the importance of critiquing the critique even of experts for a more well-rounded assessment. So please bookmark your calendars, like and share this link with friends and colleagues. And then we have African-American days of the week uh, it starts with Umoja, Kujicha, Gilia. So it looks to me like um, uh, the Swahili, Swahili days, but it, it reminds me of Kwanzaa, but, you know, that's about it, okay? So that being said, uh, we have this dude who claimed to have formal training in linguistics. You know, he's on tape saying that line, you know. Let's deal with the PhD combo. And for the record, I wanted to ask that question. But shortly before I started this live stream, I actually found the response. I actually went on the Pan-African Journal. Uh, I forgot the exact title, uh, probably Journal of Pan-African Studies. But anyway, um, I, I, I made a quick search with the name Campbell. But actually, they have a website for that book. And on that website, they do have a response to Campbell. So I have not read the response, but for those who are interested, well, I would I would go in order actually. I will show you how to reach, how to obtain Dr. Campbell's article. So here you can use any search engine and type in Campbell origin of the word Amen. Now you have a few results there. What I prefer to use here is that website there. All right. 
that's the Ghana Journal of Linguistics website. And here you can see PDF. So you can do a right click, save as, or you can just click and it will open in a new window. And then you can also save in PDF format. So that's how you can obtain this, all right? And as for the response, I will actually share the link to the PDF of the critique first. So, uh, Dr. Embon's critique. Okay. That being done. The response is by Jahi Isa and Salim Faraji, both PhDs. Response of Dr. Jahi and Dr. Faraji. Let me check the spelling. Faraji. Okay, Salim Faraji. Okay. So you have in the chat the link to uh, both PDFs, see. But once again, I have not yet read the response of Dr. Jai and Dr. Faraji. I'm planning on doing that, you know, actually after this live stream, which will probably last a little while. Now let me share Dr. Campbell's critique. I will probably do this. All right, so we have the full screen. Okay, we're good to go. It's large enough, isn't it? Editorial book critique, the origin of the word Amen, ancient knowledge the Bible has never told. Obadele Bakari Combo, editor in chief, abstract. The origin of the word Amen. Ancient knowledge the Bible has never told is a book that promises to pique the interest of any reader interested in classical Kemet, Black Nation slash Land of the Blacks, Merunecher hieroglyphs, the Akan language and historical linguistic connections between the three. Specifically, the book promises to deliver information about how the word Imen, Amen, as attested in classical Kemet, persists, persists in the contemporary Akan language. Uh, you will notice that when we have Kemet, I will not all read, always read Black Nation slash Land of the Blacks because it comes quite often. So, while under a steady hand, this should be a simple enough thesis to substantiate, unfortunately, the author's obvious lack of grounding in historical linguistics, their lack of knowledge of modern nature, as well as their lack of understanding of morphology, word structure of the Akan language, or more the analysis presented in the book. You have the keywords, you have the name of the editors and the author, and also the, 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 the publisher, uh, Amen Ra Theological Seminary Press. Introduction. In the origin of the word Amen, ancient knowledge the Bible has never told, but should be an open and shut case is saddled with a plethora of spurious lookalikes and folk etymologies prompted by attempts to analyze one language with another without actually having studying the language to be analyzed itself. Indeed, even if any of the numerous comparisons 
made in the book actually turned out to be etymologically related without methodology there is no way to determine whether they actually are or not nor how the authors came to their conclusions in other words the conclusions are not scientifically re replicable nor verifiable by any discernible method in fact the book as a whole lacks any clear implicit or explicit linguistic based methodology whatsoever from what can be gleaned from having read the book twice the practice therein seems to be simply find any word with a m and n in that order and posit that the source word must be amen or amen the foreword of the book states that after decades of research as a philologist and scholar of ancient egyptian history and religion i have proven that the word amen is of ancient egyptian origin and the Akans and the Akans of Ghana and Ivory Coast still possess within their lexicon verbal relics of the god Amen, which substantiates the Akan claim to ownership of this ancient Egyptian universal deity. That's from the foreword of the book. The central problem of the book is foreshadowed in this very statement, which mentions study of history and religion without mention of the study of the Medunetra language itself, its grammar, or any aspect of linguistics pertaining thereto. Beyond, those, beyond these specific technical limitations, it is clear to the reader that even a basic understanding of morphology, morphosemantics, and or knowledge of what morphemes are and how they work are not evident within the pages of the book. However, we readily find such statements as, remarkably, the word Amen leaves on in the Tui. I think it might be pronounced Tui. You know, I don't really have the accent. You know, don't crucify me, please. So in the Tui word for ancestors as Nsamanfo and the place where the ancestors dwell, Nsamando. In other words, for the Akan, the ancestors are the people of Amen who dwell in the land of Amen. That's on page one. This passage demonstrates a complete lack of understanding of one, what morphemes are, and two, where the morpheme boundaries in the Akan languages in the Akan language are. The root of both Nsamanfo and Asamando is I'm not sure how to pronounce that and serves as pluralizer in the first of the two words while in the second the prefix should be a functioning as a normalizer i'm sorry not normalizer functioning as a nominalizer rather than n that's from combo and dua and apa 2018 to randomly decide to ignore the prefixes as well as the s the latter of which is an integral part of the root word asaman itself. I presume that the first symbol stands for a, you know. Uh, so itself betrays a lack of knowledge of how the Akan language operates, a lack of knowledge of linguistics as a discipline in general, and morphology as it pertains to the to word structure specifically. The equivalent of the analysis contained in the book will be like saying something to the effect of salamander, adamant, militiaman, shaman, amanda, seaman, and cameraman are all derived from amen. Then, once the declaration is made, it could simply be buttressed by coming up, by coming up with a folk etymological backstory in prose to justify the whole exercise. Such a practice, while perhaps fun to do and even entertaining to the reader, is not historical linguistics. It is folk etymology under the guise of linguistics. Number two, the author's ideas and the book's thesis. In this section of the editorial book critic, 
I will discuss the author's ideas and the book's thesis within a scholarly perspective. This will serve as a critical assessment of the book within the larger scholarly discourse. Firstly, and most strikingly, the author seemed to be wholly unaware of the work of Tata Theophal Obenga, who has already made comparisons between Imen, Amen, and contemporary African languages, Obenga, 1993. In fact, the authors, the authors do not critique, draw from, or even refer to this work. There is a thin line between actually doing groundbreaking research on the one hand and simply failing to do even a cursory review of relevant literature. This is particularly unfortunate as a review of the works of those who actually have formal training in linguistics, such as Tata Obenga. Now, Dr. Obadele Kambo stated that Dr. Theofar Obenga has formal training in linguistics and the University of uh, San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken, states that Dr. Theofalo Benga has some degrees in linguistics, but you heard a wannabe linguist, false flagger, who stated publicly that Obenga doesn't have any degree in linguistics, really in order to try to legitimate himself, the fake linguist, not having any degree, but trying to have people believe that he does. Let's continue. So, such as Tata Obenga will certainly help the author's cause in the era of credibility. In the area of credibility. Further, it will also help in terms of understanding that historical linguistics, as a highly technical subfield, requires a methodology beyond what seems to amount to making a surface observation that one word may happen to look like another word in an entirely different language or any word that has an M and an N in it should be given a convincing backstory that ties it to the word Imen, Amen, somehow. Again, the central thesis that the word Imen, Amen, is found in classical Kemet is indisputable and beyond question. The thesis that this word persists in contem contemporary African languages is also well-founded and should be easy to substantiate. However, the major errors in this book, factual, scholarly, methodological, and otherwise, detract from the overall thesis and the arguments made it, I'm sorry, made in it to the point that it will be hard to recommend it Without serious, without serious reservation. Three errors that detract from the thesis and arguments made in the book. In hopes of advancing the research, this section of the editorial book critic will take a brief look at the aforementioned errors that detract from the thesis and arguments made in the book, as there are too many to cover them all, and since doing so will well and truly require a book of equal or greater length than the origin of the word Amen, ancient knowledge the Bible has never told. Here I will simply look at some of the most obvious and egregious beginning with the following passage. The historic founder of Egypt's first dynasty, popularly known as Nama, and sometimes given the name Menes, according to the reports of Herodotus and Manetho, actually carried the royal name Heru, the soaring, of, the soaring falcon of Amen. In fact, Herodotus and Manetho, Manetho rendering of the name of the founder of ancient Egyptian civilization as, as Menes, provided the clue that his name carried the royal title Amen. Herodotus acquired his information from the priest scribe of ancient Egypt that had for over 2,000 years recorded the names of their kings on papyrus like the historic Turin papyrus. That's on page 11. Apparently, the authors did not deem it necessary to actually go and read the sources with which they claim to be familiar. The relevant quote from Herodotus in Greek and in translation and with translation is as follows. The priest 
told me that Min was the first king of Egypt. And that first, he separated Memphis from the Nile by a dam. All the river had flowed close under the sandy mountains on the Libyan side, but Min made the southern bend of it, which begins about a hundred furlongs above Memphis. By damming the stream, thereby he dried up the ancient course and carried the river by a channel so that it flowed midway between the hills. And to this day, the Persians keep careful guard over this bend of the river, strengthening its dam every year that it may keep the current in. For where the Nile to burst his dikes and overflow here, all Memphis were in danger of drowning. Then, when this, then when this first king Min had made what he thus cut off to be dry land, he first founded in it that city, which is now called Memphis. Herodotus and Godly, 1986, <clears throat> 384-387. Herodotus, 2018, both emphasis added. This demonstrates a clear lack of academic rigor with regard to the authors apparently not having actually read the text to which they refer. Beyond the serious lapse, from a methodological perspective, attempting to use Greek to ascertain the original name in Medunecher is not reliable because Greek masculine proper nouns in the normative case, including surnames, commonly ends in S. GreekPod101.com, 2020. Thus, Greek authors rendering a name as menace would not be an indication of the form of the source, of the source word for, from Medunetra, but would rather tell us about how the grammar of the Greek language works. How someone within in Greek, I'm sorry, how someone writing in Greek may choose to represent any names or words from a different unrelated language is clearly not the best way to ascertain the specific source word, especially when, in this case, the actual source word is readily available in Medunetia for all to read. Yet, incredibly, the, the book argues that the translation of Irka Amen to Ergamenes clearly demonstrates that the name Menes referred to the word Amen and that the Egyptian priest Manitho stated that the founding pharaoh of ancient Egypt carried the royal name of Amen, and that's from page 11. This is simply faulty logic and a mistake that no one who has actually studied Medunetra or who has actually read the primary source text could ever make. In this case, the intransitive verb from which the name many, many, he who endures, is derived is clearly men, the firm, established, enduring of king. Vargas 2015, um, 1378. Adding the E to men, enduring, makes it he who endures. Long Storm 2020. There's a G after the 2020. I don't know if it's a typo or if that's supposed to be there. Anyone with even the most rudimentary knowledge of Medunetra should be aware of this very regular process. Indeed, anyone with that knowledge of Medunetra should at least be able to observe that Nesut Biti Meni and Imen are clearly not the same word, and therefore it would be wrong to treat them as such. Indeed, if primary sources written in Medunetra were consulted, one would find the Sudbiti many in one entry of the Turin Papyrus that the authors mention in passing, Gardener 1959, 2, page 10. They would find another entry written as the Sudbiti many, Gardener 1959, 2, page 11, von Beckerath. 1999 38 39 1 uh, column e2 in either case 
is their menis or emen, amen, to be found in the original Medonature hieroglyphs more pointedly, nesed biti meni, is clearly different from amen or emen. In terms of both form and semantic content as mentioned, the two words simply have the same phonemes in them in the same order. Nonetheless, the book continues in this worrying vein to the tune of the following. What are the etymological and linguistic roots of the name menace? Menace is a Greek transliteration of the word amen. That's page 11. However, this is another methodological lapse in that the book does not include any consideration that there is a multitude of other words in Medonecha that have the consonant sequence M plus N in that order, I'm sorry, yes, in that order other than Imen, Amen, and which could thereby be the source of the word as it may or may not happen to be rendered in Greek. Indeed, a cursory search of Vigas 2015 turns up a whopping 436 words in Medonecha that have the garden assigned Y5, um, that's the Senate game, the biliteral men, which is the same glyph used in the word Imen or Amen. Some of these other words are shown in Table 1. So, Table 1, a bridge sample of words in Medonecha that contain biliteral men, but that do not mean Imen or Amen. Once again, Vigus 2015. So you have different examples. You have men be firm, established, entering. You have um, mensa, ejaculation, orgasm, it's a noun. You have menu, club, kudgel, noun. You have meneset, lack, noun. You have many, da, intransitive verb. You have menit, more, mooring, post, weeping, post, noun. You have many, corvée, forced labor, noun. You have men, sick man, the wretched man, noun. You have menchu, Bedouin, noun. And you have menu, pain, noun. This means that there are literally hundreds of words other than imen or amen from which any supposed Greek rendering of menace could potentially be derived. Below in table two, is an abridged list of rulers with garden assigned Y5 men in their names, wherein those names are not derived from the root, I'm sorry, are not derived from the word Emen or Amen. Table two, uh, okay, I don't need to repeat that. So we have Nisud Bitimeni, he who endures. We have Sara, Men Kara, son of Ra, the Men Ka Ra, established one of the Ka of Ra. Learn Storm 2020 J. We have Men Hau Her, Men Kau Ho, establish of appearances of hair. Learn Storm 2020 L. We have Nesut Biti Menkara, Nesut Biti Menkara, establish one of the Ka of Ra, Learn Storm 2020 B. We have Sara Menchu Hotep, son of Ra, Menchu Hotep. Muntu is at peace, non storm 2020 D. We have Nesud Biti Semen and Ra, Nesud Biti Semen and Ra, the one whom Ra has made firm, non storm 2020 I. Sara Menchu M Sa F, son of Ra. Mentu, Muntu is his protection, non storm 2020 K. We have Sara Semenech Ka Ra, Jeser Cheperu. Um, son of Ra, Semen Kara, Joseph Keperu, potent, potent is the Ka of Ra, sacred of forms, Lord Storm 2020A. We have Nesud Biti Men Khepera, lasting is the manifestation of Ra, Lord Storm 2020C. And we have Nesud Biti Men Ma'at Ra, enduring is the truth of Ra, Lord Storm 2020E. Now, for anybody that's taking Medonature classes or that is learning uh, with somebody or by themselves, it's very interesting to look at those names, look at the glyphs and the, trans the translations. Now, 
there is an adage that states, if your only tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Investigator 2014. In this case, it appears that if one's knowledge of medu nature is limited to Imen, Amen, one will be hard pressed to understand that there are other names that have M and N in them, in that order, that are not traceable to Imen or Amen, but which are clearly attested in the historical record. This begs the question of were actual primary source documents not consulted? After all, as mentioned above, the name Nesud Biti Meni is attested very clearly in the so-called Turin Canaan. Indeed, the so-called Turin Canaan, the so-called Abydos King List, the so-called Palermo Stone, the seal impression of Ka'i'a, Her Ka'a, the raised arm of Heru, and the seal impression of Herden, Heruden, the slaughterer, are the authoritative primary sources for the names of the earliest rulers of Kemet. Why then do the authors seem to think it prudent to hope over actual textual records from Kemet itself to rely on supposed transliteration of Greek authors that they clearly did not even deem necessary to check for themselves. As mentioned previously, in all actual fact, Herodotus rather represented the name as Mina slash Mini, not Menes, as erroneously claimed by the authors. Indeed, to go from a supposed Menes that Herodotus did not even write to then guess that the original word in Medunetia must have been Imen or Amen will be tentament to saying Salim, Slime, Slim, Slam, Slum, and Islam are all the same word because they look vaguely similar on the surface in that they have the same consonants in the same order and they may or may not happen to be represented in the same way in Greek. If someone were to make such unsubstantiated conjectures, he slash she will be prudently advised to simply learn the English language and or Arabic and to quit guessing. Again, as far as the book goes, it looks like instance after instance of running with surface resemblance in terms of how a word happens to be rendered in the Latin script and then added in a backstory rather than actually understanding more for semantics, historical linguistics, or how the grammar of Medu nature actually work at even the most basic level. These are the pitfalls of writing about a language without actually taking the time to study that language well or at all. Similarly, it is the result of tackling what must certainly be regarded as a complex and technical linguistic related study without sufficient linguistics training. Indeed, the book's lack of any coherent methodology does not allow for disambiguation between surface lookalikes and actual substantive etymological relation based on throughout, I'm sorry, on thorough research and evidence-based analysis. It is methodologically flawed to rely on purported Greek transcriptions rather than consulting the actual meta nature text in question to simply read what it says. Another glaring mistake is made in the following passage. The writing of Nama's name carried the phonetic value of Na, which because of its proximity to the catfish sign on the artifact in which it was discovered has been interpreted as equivalent to the word catfish. And as from page 11 and 12, such a statement reveals an inability or unwillingness to consult relevant source text. More pointedly, even if source texts are consulted, it is of the utmost importance to actually learn how to read them. To say the writing of Nama's name carried the phonetic value of Na does not make sense given that the authors do not represent it phonetically, but decide to use an apostrophe rather than an international phonetic alphabet 
or IPA transcription to write the name. What they render with the apostrophe will be na if one was to actually even follow Egyptological trans transliteration convention. However, this convention is still never to be confused with the actual phonetic value of the word mentioned in the book, page 11. It is common knowledge that the I'm sorry, it is common knowledge and the fact cannot be stressed enough that the transcription is purely conventional. The Egyptological transcription must not be interpreted as a phonological and even less as a phonetic representation. That's from, uh, I'm not sure if you pronounce it pust or pust, 1999, page 47. Thus, the means by which they came by the phonetic value is another head scratcher. Further, to mention the writing of the name Nama in proximity to the catfish sign means the authors are utterly lost when it comes to Medonature itself. Page 11 to 12. The writing of the name is not in proximity to the catfish, the catfish sign. The catfish is itself one of the two glyphs, a biliteral and, I'm sorry, a triliteral and biliteral respectively. Actually, used to write the name as shown in figure one. The two glyphs can be read clearly in the examples below. We have the ripple of water, the arm, the mouth, and the catfish. That spells na. Catfish, according to Vargas, 2050, uh, page 714. And then we have the chisel, the owl, the mouth, and the... Um, I'm not sure if this is a swallow, but we, ha we have one bird, and it spells mer. The bird here actually doesn't have any phonetic value, but anyway, that spells mer, and in this, this way, it means painful. It might not be the swallow anyway. It might be that bird that we have for the word bean and other negative words. Anyway, so that's from Vargas, same date, page 1145. Uh, for the record, you know, some people say uh, by... Literal, some people say by consonants. Again, na catfish represents half of the name. It is not in proximity to the name as shown in the serech of figure one. The book goes on in words that can only be described as both confused and confusing, saying, yet the phonogram na seems to be a forerunner to the later imen heru or men or meaning Amen Heru and the catfish symbol was simply the shamanic and totemic symbol used by the king to convey his power as an expression of the neutral word, world, sorry, and his allegiance to his clan. And that's on page 12. By what means has their na transformed into either Imen Heru or men, which somehow, which somehow also means Amen Heru. What is the phonological rule by which this supposed transformation takes place? In what phonological environment? What are the natural classes of sounds involved? And what are the implications throughout the phonetic inventory? The reader is left to only guess. Also, which supposed clan is this? Without a reference or shred of evidence in this phantom clan, to which allegiance is being paid in sight, the reader is left once again to guess. We are also left to wonder what exactly is a shamanic or totemic symbol doing in the middle of, se of a sehe, and on what basis the book should include the notion that a trilito, rather than simply being read, should be regarded as such. Even more disturbing is the revelation that the author seems to think that Hernar, Herunama, as a whole, was a title, as evidenced in the following quote from the book, which states that the name Nama was not the personal name of the founding king of Egyptian dynastic civilization, but a royal title was Heru Amen, the soaring falcon of Amen. And that's from page 12. Even the beginner knows of what is referred to as the so-called Horus name of each ruler wearing hair is typically written above the personal name of the ruler as seen is Her Ka'ia or Heru Ka'a, seal impression, which shows the name Her Narmer, Heru Narmer, to the far bottom right. 
However, the word Amen or Amen is conspicuously, I'm sorry, conspicuously missing. So what new information then are the authors actually bringing to the table? Knowledge of Horus names that have been known and understood for well over a century, Petri, um, 1888, the insertion of the word Amen or Amen where it is not written, the erasures, the erasure of the glyphs Nama where they actually are written, the reader is left to wonder what he slash she is supposed to actually do with all of this. Another point missing from the discussion is that the early rulers of Kemet were known as Shemsu Her, followers of Heru, making it evident why the earliest names of rulers and indeed names of rulers throughout the history of Kemet were prefaced with Her. After all, the rulers were understood as being the very incarnation of Her. Yet again, the author seems the author seem obviousness to all this in their desperation to rope an unwilling Amen Amen by some means, no matter how dubious the grounds for the claims may be. In the book, we also find the following. This royal title was Heru Amen, the soaring falcon of Amen, page 12. Here I must point out that what is featured is, as a rule, a, pair, a, pair, a perched falcon rather than a soaring falcon in conjunction with the name where in her name her name the authors find soaring or amen is a mystery however it should be noted that one cannot simply create meanings out of thin air as neither soaring nor amen feature in the name her name or her name while the author argues that the serer should also be read as Amen. Amen. The argument remains unconvincing, particularly for those who have studied unity roles and are aware that the word Serech should be read as Serech. Now, somehow, some way, maybe you can understand why some people who like to change grammatical rules and make up stuff as they go, as they go, will try to defend some strange stuff like that because they are known for making up stuff for years i.e allah is in the egyptian text or ra is a volcano and if they don't have the liberty of doing linguistic acrobatics and linguistic gymnastics then their enterprise is in jeopardy moving right along in the book it is declared that, therefore, Herodotus and Menetheus menace and the archaeological, archaeological discovery of the name Nama are titles that both refer to the historic royal name of Amen Heru, page 13. The book does not demonstrate that the personal name Nama is a title. <laughs> you remember some people who told us that came after a name is a title? Indeed, if it was a title, one would expect that said title would be applied to others. However, because Her, Heru, is a title while Nama is a personal name, it is only Her, Heru, that is applied to other rulers. Nama, on the other hand, because it is a personal name and not a title, is not applied to anyone else. Yet, incredibly, the statement is made that the name Nama was not the personal name of the founding king of Egyptian dynastic civilization, but a royal title carried also by other kings of the pre-dynastic and early dynastic period. That's on page 12. Who were those kings? What were their personal names? Where is the primary source evidence that illustrates the existence of these phantom, phantom kings? Indeed, if Nama is a so-called title, the burden of proof is on the authors of the book to show evidence that any other ruler had the so-called title Nama prefacing his or her personal name, whatever that may have been. Further, 
the Her, Heru name of every other ruler, which also appeared in a Serech, will also have to be dealt with in the same way, an unwidely proposition. Another demonstration of a dearth of knowledge with regard to matter nature is evinced in an ascribing incorrect captions to images when the matter nature is clearly visible and the image itself for all to read. An instance of this can be seen on page 15, where the caption in English says, Amen in ancient Egypt, but in Medu Nature it clearly says, Imen Ra Nisut Necheru, Amen Ra Nisut Necheru, King of Divinities. Not just Amen as mistakenly claimed by the authors on page 15. Now, on the left, we have figure three, which is the image from the book on page 15. And you can see the caption right under the picture. And it says, I'm in ancient Egypt. And Dr. Campbell is talking about what we can see here. Here, it's actually read from right to left. Okay, so we don't really see the relief well, but we have the relief here, the um, Senate game, the ripple of water. Then we have the sun disc, the single stroke, the sedge, the loaf of bread, the um, uh, ripple of water, and then we have the three nature sign, which gives us nature, which gives us the plural. So it does spell uh, imen ara nesut or nisut nature. Okay, so on the following line, it says, the Amen also stood alone as a supreme divinity and was often described as the one and only one without a second whose names are manifold and innumerable. That's on page 15. Troubling, troublingly, the authors write, Amun is a variation of Amen, while we and Ra constitute appellations for Amen. Page 39. Firstly, Ra is not an appellation, but is the nature or divinity associated with the sun, who was seen as being on par with Imen or Amen, the hidden one. Thus, the, Almaga the, Alma the amalgamation of the two as Imen Ra Nesut Neteru, Amen Ra Nesut Neteru, King of Divinities, as clearly inscribed in the photograph that they use as reproduced here in figure three. Apparently, the authors are unaware of the existence of Ra as a nature or divinity in his own right as shown in figure four and figure five. And they think of Ra as some sort of appellation, making skeptical minds question the lead author's decades of research as a philologist and scholar of ancient Egyptian history and religion. That's from the foreword of their book. Secondly, while there is no source for this quote cited, it looks suspiciously like a translation of E.A. Wallis Burge, who writes, Adoration to thee, O Amen Ra, and goes on to translate the later part of the adoration as Thou one, thou only one, who hast no second, whose names are manifold and innumerable. Burge, 1913, 195-196. While the others may not be able to read Medu Nature in the picture they provided on page 15 of their book without photo credit, they can certainly read the English translation provided by Burge, which clearly reads Amen Ra. And not simply Amen. Once again, Burge 1913, page 195. Further, the fact that the authors use a quotation without citing their source will be regarded by many as plagiarism. Now, notice that we are dealing with one sentence. Why some people have plagiarized whole paragraphs for their book that they sold, not for articles that they shared online. 
to move to the section featuring the Akan language. We find a quote, the Akans before their exodus belonged to the Ayoko clan whose primary deity was a falcon. Page 24. Apparently, the authors did not deem it necessary to study the Akan language to know that the name of the Matri clan in question is um, probably, now I'm, I'm not sure if I should pronounce that, Ayokoa, not Ayoko, although it may sound like Ayoko to the untrained ear. Further, the Akurama hawk or hawk is not an abosom deity, but rather what is referred to in Akan as Akieneboa or Akraboa, commonly rendered as totem in English, Morgan 2020. In any case, the book fails to mention that other seven Musuaban, matrilineages and matriclans of the Asante, namely the Ekoana represented by the Ekoa water buffalo, the Biretuo represented by Ose Ase, Aseba leopard, the Asona represented by the Kwa Kwa Dabi crow, the Agona represented by the Aku parrot, the Aduana represented by the Akraman dog, the Asakiri represented by the Apete vulture. Now I presume that um, a symbol that looks like the Aleph uh, is pronounced uh, A. So please don't crucify, don't crucify me. I'm not familiar with the Tui language. I just know the greeting, Memoache, Akwaba. And as, Asene, represented by the Apan bat. The authors apparently focus on the falcon because it seems to be in, an, in alignment with their back story, but effectively ignore all the Af Akan people who are not from that one clan. Another questionable piece of scholarship is found in the following passage which states, Ra referred to the sun. Ra had a simile in the word we or we, the sun. Thus, when calling the God of gods with his right sobriquet, one could arrive at either Amon Ra or Amon We. And that's from page 34 of their book. It is at this point that the reader is made aware that the authors do not seem to know what a simile is or how to use that word appropriately. Secondarily, the reader is made aware that the book does not take into account the fact that Ui is a masculine dual form in Mother Nature and has nothing to do with the sun. Allen, 2014, Gardener, 1957. Indeed, Mfanse, a dialect of Akan and Mother Nature are not one and the same, whereby one will be able to project one's understanding of a Mfanse word into Mother Nature as a shortcut to avoid having to actually learn Mother Nature itself. This lack of understanding is evident in the following quote that states, the word we occurs as suffix of the names of two pharaohs. One, the pharaoh Hotep Sechemwi, the 21st pharaoh of the second dynasty, 2890 to 26,876 BCE and Hasem Hasemwi of the fourth pharaoh of the same dynasty. That's on page 34. Again, it is clear that the authors cannot read Medunetra as upon doing so, one will clearly see the two Sechem scepters of authority side by side in the written name Her Hotep Sechemwi, literally, literally Heru Hotep Sechemwi, piece of the two scepters. A clear sign that we are dealing with the masculine jewel and not the Mfanse word for the sun. Petri, 1901, plate 8, line 8 to 11. I presume that's line 8 to 11. 
Von Becker, Beckerath, 1999, pages 42 to 43. And then we have one column H. Even for someone who does not know how to read, in taking a look at the Medu Nature, one would at the very least clearly see two of something that would demand explanation. In this case, the explanation will be that it is an instantiation of the masculine dual form. Further, while the date 26,876 given in the text is clearly a typo, the more egregious error is the positioning of name Her Hetep Sehemwi, literally Heru Hotep Sehemwi, piece of the two scepters, as the 21st of the Nasi II. The, the problematic nature of superimposing the modern Manitonian derived Egyptological concept of dynasty aside, even if one is going to use that system, one should at least get it right that this is the first and founding ruler of dynasty second. Secondly, Her Seter Hasehemwi, appearance of the two scepters, is the 11th and final ruler of that dynasty, Lord Storm 2020H. More importantly, the analysis of the name given in the book is yet another case whereby even a basic understanding of Medu Nature, even a basic understanding of Medu Nature gr grammar is replaced by the misunderstanding that Ui, masculine dual, is a so-called simile for Ra or Ra. Next, I will turn my attention to the second section of the book, which features the author's understanding of Medu Nature words through the lens of the Akan lang language and vice versa. A brief sample of this ill-fated interpretation is given below. The first of these that I will look at is their oddly rendered Amen Hotepe. The author's Akan based analysis is clearly derived from modern Egyptological rendering in Latin characters rather than an understanding of Medu Nature. Number two, A. Amen, ho, te, pe. Amen, body, clean, perfect. Amen, ho, te, i.e. Amen is of immaculate holiness. Page 42. This will be a workable analysis if the name was based on an Akan phrase. However, the morphosemantics of Akan and the morphosemantics of Medu Nature as are not one and the same further. Without an understanding of morpheme boundaries, errors are bound to ensue. Below is the analysis of the name based on how Medu Nature actually works. We have Inem and we have Hotep or Hetep. Amen, peace, which, which, which will be translated as Amen is at peace. Other would say, others would say Amen is satisfied. As we can see, the authors clearly do not know where the morphine boundaries are, and therefore they try to break up a single triliteral HTEP or HTP piece into constituent parts that obviously do not exist in the original Medu Nature. Their method, or lack thereof, will be akin to analyzing the name with English to say that it is etymologically derived from Amen hot. EP, meaning that Amen just dropped a hot new record album. Now, before I continue, some of you might have heard people say that Israel, I S R A E L, derived from Isis Ra L. We're dealing with the same kind of linguistic acrobatics and linguistic gymnastics. As ridiculous as such a proposition would be to all and sundry, in the case of this book, the reader is apparently just supposed, I guess two is missing, just supposed to go along for the bumpy ride. Indeed, to use one language to analyze, to, I'm sorry, indeed, 
to use one language to analyze another is a path that is fraught with folly, particularly when at least one of the languages in question is not understood by the one doing the analysis. This problem is compounded when the writer is similarly ignorant of comparative slash historical linguistic methodology. Alarmingly, none of the three authors seem to find any problem with the analysis itself, nor with the fun fundamental issues that led to the problematic analysis in the first place. The next interpretation is given by the authors as 3a, amen, me, se, or se, however you want to pronounce it. So we have amen, first singular processive, and we have se for father. Amen, se, amen, me, se, i.e., amen, my father which should be properly rendered as Imen Messi, Amen, give birth. Now, we have Imen, that we call Amen in English, and we have Messi, which stands for give birth. So it will be translated as born of Amen. Some digitologists will, uh, will write Amen gave birth to him. As can, be, as can be clearly seen, the word Messi, give birth, cannot be broken down into my father, which in middle nature will be it e an entirely different construction. Now, for those who have been taking middle nature classes, the spelling of the word it, which means father, is a bit unusual because we do have the horned viper reference, gardener reference I9, but it does not render any sound F. It's just pronounced E. Okay. And then we have the seated man, which in this case is a suffix pronoun E. So it e my father. In a similar vein, the authors provide another dubious analysis in three. Number four, a amen mo na ete. Amen. Uh, I don't know what the conj stands for. Then we have second singular plural, f o c, and then we have third singular, um, and then we have uh, inan, and then dash leave. Amen monete. I.e. Amen lives with you. He was a godfather in the mention of Amenem Hotepe the third, and that's from page 42 of the book. In this case, an actual analysis of what the real name will be cannot be given because without any primary or secondary source mentioned in the book, it is impossible to know what is meant by godfather in the mention or who any personage by that name may actually have been as attested by the historical record. Regardless, to concoct a twee meaning for a name in writ for a name in written in Latin characters without a source and also without Medo nature as a reference is once again a path fraught with folly. The book continues in this worrying vein of using Akan, Akan to interpret Medunetia words slash names as they happen to be transcribed in Latin characters or using Latin character renderings of Medunetia in an attempt to make sense of Akan names. What it would be fair to address each entry one by one again, to do so would require a book of equal or greater length than the origin of the word Amen, ancient knowledge the Bible has never told which tips the scale at 89 pages. In sum, because the authors have no apparent method apart from seeing which words looks like which when rendered into the Latin script, they are forced to rely on ill-fated attempts to make square pegs fit into round holes. These backstories are buttressed by alleging corruption of the name. When the facts of the matter refuse to be packaged neatly into whatever interpretation is being argued for. And we'll talk, he's referring to page 36 of the book. In the final analysis, a lack of knowledge of Medunetier, as well as a lack of understanding of ba basic linguistic principles, such as the concept of the morpheme, the, the nature of diachronic 
phonological change and many other important aspects of specific, specific technical knowledge doom the entire exercise from the outset and consign the vast majority of surface, surface lookalikes to the dust bin before even getting started. Other problems with the book include unsupported declarations like, according to one local historian, the authors interviewed while conducted research on this book, a song dedicated to Amen was the last song that many Africans sang before entering the notorious slave castles and departing to the new world. Whether or not these songs were exclusively sung by Akans who are sold off to slavery is not known, and that's from page 26. Firstly, how does last song turn into these songs? Such declarations leave the reader wondering who this mysterious local historian is and what his or her name is. Further, how does he or she know what song many Africans were singing hundreds of years ago when they entered notorious slave castles, often spirited in by enslavers under the cover of darkness to avoid detection, but mysteriously singing audibly, which would doubtless attract unwanted attention. Also, how many Africans constitutes many? 30, 100, 1000? What exactly are the lyrics of this song and or these songs? In short, how did this unnamed person come to know what he or she knows, assuming he or she actually even exists? If this person exists, why is he, she not properly identified and cited even as a personal correspondent so that the information could be verified by other researchers? And before I continue, we have two dudes who try to tell us that um, um, the, 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 the two dudes who try to tell us that Kemet means repairing and then a repairing country that came after a name doesn't mean black, but or doesn't have anything to do with color, but that is, that, that is a title. Um, I ask um, um, the dude that has Ma'at in his name, the dude who has plagiarized James P. Allen, if they have any scholars, any PhDs that agree with their claims, and he, he said that they have 10 scholars that agree with their claims. Of course, we didn't get any single name, you know, but it's easy to make claims. Now we have RP in the place to be who wrote I mean, hot EP is hilarious. Hey, you know, that, that's a little job, you know what I'm saying? But it, it is friendly. It is friendly. It could be worse, you know? And we will read, you know, all the way and we will see the conclusion of the author. And I understand why the author decided to touch on that topic. Because if it's not a good look, then, you know, it doesn't help anybody. Period. The authors continue with the following. The African-American spiritual Amen is a remnant of an ancient chant sung to the Amen in Ghana. Although the song was arranged by the famous African-American composer, Jester Hurston, Hurston, the song predates his findings. It was during the slave trade at the Middle Passage that it, I'm sorry, it was during the slave trade and the Middle Passage that it became a unifying Pan-African survival chant for those Africans transported to the United States. Therefore, it should not be surprising that the African-American spiritual Amen is actually a traditional West African chant to the god Amen redeployed in a new form in the context of American slavery. And that's from page 28. You know, this makes me think of that Hebrews or light who is familiar with Hebrew and apparently Aramaic, and he is also familiar with the Medan nature. I have seen that. Um, and he actually said that, what is it that he said? Um, he talked about a language from Ghana. Oh, that escapes me, but I'm sure you've heard it. Um, Nyame. I, yeah, I think he said Nyame is Yahweh. I think that's what he said. I mean, we, we hear all sorts of things, you know, but we will get clarity anyway. So let me continue. The burning question here, once again, is on what basis are these claims being made? Is this more testimony from the unnamed local historian? Is it conjecture? Is it pure 
anachronistic imagination, again, without a source or citation by which the critical and skeptical reader could pursue even the very possibility of following up, we are left with more questions than answers. Another error is found in a passage which mentions the Amenemhet kings, and that an inscription at Thebes that tells that he probably was the son of a woman named Nofret from Elephantine, a tradition that the prophecy of Nefreti confirms. And that's from page 75 to 76. In referring to the prophecy of Nefreti, it appears that the authors are once again content to refer to a text without actually reading it as the prophecy of Nefreti. Does not mention any Nofret from Elephantine. The relevant lines of the text are as follow. So we have first Nesut, then we have Pu. Uh, now the W is pronounced Pu for the record, even though I'm aware some people will pronounce it like a English W, but most Egyptologists will tell you that the W is pronounced Pu. Underneath it says Dem, probably for demonstrative. Uh, then we have um, R, you have F-U-T, probably standing for future. Then we have Eat, which stands for come. We have N, which stands for from. We have Resi, which stands for South, and finally Imeni, that we will call Ameni in English. And the name Ameni or Imeni is written in the Shenu or the Kartush, right uh, at, uh, at the end of the sentence. Um, so that will give us this Nesut, and Nesut, for those who don't know, is a word for that we translate as king. This Nesut will come from the South, Ameni, so Ameni being his name. Uh, just an observation, eat, come, we have the term et, and you usually hear me saying, Hotep Senuhena Senut, et. I'm saying welcome when I say et, and you can hear et in the name Nefertiti, which when we break it down is Neferet et. Then we have another sentence. We have Sa, now Sa is just a duck. Uh, the seated person is a determinative. Then we have Hemet. The well is described as a well. It's either the glyph N41 or N42, according to Gardner's classification. It's a bile to a hem. Then we have the loaf of bread that gives us the T. So we have Hemet. And we have the determinative of the woman and another glyph underneath the loaf of bread, which doesn't have any phonetic value there. Then once again, we have Pu. Then we have N. Then we have the glyph for Ta. The single stroke, the determinative. Then we have the glyph for uh, the transituation S T set that we will call Seti. So that gives us Ta Seti or the land of the bar. Then we have the three fox skin, which is the body to a mess. Then we have the folded cloth, which is a phonetic complement. It's the sound S, but we don't repeat it. Okay. Then we have the the uh, the other glyph again that we have on the lift, um, loaf of bread for the word hemet, no phonetic value for that word. And once again, we have poo, and then we have the N underneath. So that all, all this gives us son of this woman of Taseri, child of. And at the bottom, we have hen or henu, um, nechen, inside nechen, the interior of nechen. And that's coming from Campbell and Bochwe and his forthcoming page 43. That is to say, Nechen, so-called Haria Compolis, is not the same as Abu, so-called Elephantine, nor is the actual name of his mother identified in the text. While a sympathetic yet critical reader, such as myself, will not doubt the sincerity with which the authors approach the subject of their book. Unfortunately, it is, harm, it is hamstrung from the outset by factual, methodological, typographical, scholarly, and numerous other errors and flaws. These errors and flaws are too many to mention, and indeed, they raise more questions than the book has the ability to answer. Number four, author's affiliation and authority. According to the first author, Agia Okwame Osei, he states in the foreword that I schooled in Ghana and obtained degrees in English and postgraduate studies in linguistics from both Cape Coast University and the University of Ghana. That's from the foreword of their book. 
This begs the question of what degree did he receive and from which university did he complete his postgraduate studies? If so, what was the exact nature of his postgraduate degree? And again, from which university? As with most of the book, this information leaves more questions than answers. I personally find it um, particular, not to say strange, as someone will mention that he has degrees in a particular field without naming the actual degrees. But in a so-called conscious community, uh, we are used to many people claiming to have degrees that they don't have. I'm not saying that this author did not have his degrees. I'm just saying that I find it a bit strange or particular that he would not name what degrees he had. In an email, correspondence, Salim Farage, PhD, stated, I am a historian steeped in archaeological and anthropological research with modest training in Coptic, Metu Netter, and ancient Greek. Farage, 2020. Whatever the nature of the training in Greek may have been, that training is not readily apparent in terms of how the original Greek text written by Herodotus was not consulted to see that Herodotus wrote Mina slash Mini rather than Menes, as claimed by the authors. Also, statements like Nama's name carry the phonetic value of Na, which, because of its proximity to the catfish sign, help us see that the authors are unaware that the catfish sign itself is what is transliterated as Nar, and that it is not in proximity to any other rendering of his name. And that's from page 11 of the book. It is also not clear why Dr. Faraj writes metu netter when the phonetic complements sometimes used in the writing of the words medu netter, written characters script, clearly show that the conventional transliteration requires a D rather than the T he renders in metu. Vargas 2050, 2015, page 942. Now for the record, you have the flagpole, which stands for Netcher. Then you have the walking stick, which stands for med. Then we have the hand, that's the uniliteral or uniconsonant, de or d, as we say in English. Then we have the quelchic, which gives us the u. So we have medu. All right. The Netcher appears first, is the honorific inversion or um, honorific transposition. Out of respect, it is placed first, but it is, it is not read first. So the whole thing spells medu nature. The sitting man with the hand towards his mouth is just a determinative. There's no phonetic value for it. If there is some type of devoicing rule that the author posited, but which remain unstated, it should be conveyed clearly. Um, before I continue reading about uh, Jahi Issa's um, credentials, I've shared the link to the response of the authors it's in the chat. So the website is originofthewordamen.com. And you have a section which says about the authors, something like that. What I've seen is that Dr. Farage, actually, you know what I will show you? It's better to show it. I will briefly. Okay, so that's the website of the book. Meet the authors, that's what it says. So you have uh, O Kwame Osei, and indeed it says, it says he schooled in Ghana and obtained degrees in English and post postgraduate studies in linguistics, but uh, we don't know exactly what the degrees are, but it's okay. Uh, on the left, we have Jahi Issa, PhD, and we have Salim Faraj, PhD. Now, as for Dr. Salim Faraj, he's a professor and former chair of African Studies at California State University, Dominguez Hills. He is also the founding executive director of the Master of Arts in International Studies Africa program at Concordia University, Arvin, in Ghana, West Africa. He completed his Master of Divinity at the Claremont School of Theology, NMA, and PhD 
uh, Claremont Graduate University. So to me, it appears that his PhD is in divinity. You know, basically, you know, those guys who study to be priests or pastors or just, you know, doing the religious studies. But uh, the PhD doesn't seem to be in, you know, uh, Africana studies or, 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 or any, any other field, you know. So that's just for the record. Now, let's go back to the article. And we are reaching the end of the article, actually. We're almost done. A web page of Medgar Evers College in New York lists second author Jahi Issa, PhD, as substitute assistant professor of history, college 2020. Together with one of his co-authors of this book, Salim Faraj, PhD, he has written The Obama Administration Revisiting and Reconsidering AFRICOM and the Universal Negro Improvement Association in Louisiana, creating a provisional government in exile. Independently, Issa and Faraji, 2009, Issa, 2005. Why not much from what is readily accessible online ties Dr. Issa to historical linguistics, one would not begrudge him the fact that an understanding of history will indeed prove to be an invaluable asset with regard to the objective laid out in the book. Number five, physical content of the book. The first thing that strikes me as a reader in my first and second readings of the book is the lack of metanature hieroglyphs itself in a book about the word Amen, apart from what looks like some type of scan or copied image. The use of a metanature hieroglyphs processing program such as j -Sesh or similar is missing from the text, making the engagement with the language limited to Latin script renderings. This is a serious shortcoming. Also, out of 11 photos slash graphics, by my count, the only one which is credited, which is credited, is the one on page nine. The reader is left to guess whether the others are any of the author's own work of simply downloaded from the internet, I guess probably here, the other men to write or simply download it from the internet. It looks like a typo, but I might be wrong. Oddly, the front and back book covers feature metanature writing as a background. But ironically enough, the word Imen, Amen, is conspicuously missing from the cropped photo chosen for this purpose. There is a table of content that points the reader to the organization of this concise book, including preface, introduction, and Amen in Akan, and ancient Nubia. King Nama's real name, Amen and Nile Valley dynastic civilization, Amen in classical Nile Valley divine kingship, brief history of Amen in Nubia and Egypt, the influence of Amen in the Old Testament, Amen in the Greek or Roman world, the presence of Amen in early Christianity and the New Testament, the flourishing of Amen in late antiquity antique Africa, the Amin tradition in West Africa, the Amin tradition in the African in the Africa diaspora via the slave trade, the origin of the word Amen by O Kwame Osei. The book also boasts two short appendices, the first of which deals with listing of all the occurrences of the word Amen in the Bible. The second is somewhat of an epilogue consisting of a brief discussion on cultural continuity between Kemet and the rest of the continent. The book lacks an index, but there is a selected, but there is a selected glossary that extends from page 74 to page 83. There is not much in the way of scholarly citations in the work, but there are a few sparing footnotes used for this purpose, as on page eight, for example, the selected bio, bi, sorry, the selected bibliography is found on pages 84 to 88 and features both scholarly and non-scholarly sources. Number six, overall evaluation. While the book is clearly meant for a lay audience, an expert audience will be better equipped to read it, I'm sorry, will be better equipped to read with a critical eye. Someone without a background in Akan, Medunetio or linguistics, for example, could clearly take the book at face value and presume competent, competent and legitimate authority on the part of the authors, particularly because two of the three have PhD boldly 
emblazoned besides their names right on the front cover. However, the numerous errors at every level mean that the book is, in fact, a very dangerous for the audience for whom the book is intended. This is simply because very few readers may have the time and or energy to follow up to see if what the authors are saying is actually true by cross-referencing and fact-checking with primary and or even secondary sources. The main strength of the book is that it presents some, da some data that may be used for future researchers to, compare, to comprehensively support or repudiate the book's thesis with evidence based on historical linguistic methodology. Further, the book may serve to initiate a, a, conversation, a conversation to sensitize those who may not know the word, sorry, to sensitize those who may not know of the word amen or amen outside of the modern Judeo-Christian context. The main weakness of the book as mentioned previously, is that the authors would have been served well by a pre-publication review by anyone who reads and writes Medu Nature, someone versed in morphosemantics, as well as someone with a background in historical slash comparative linguistics. In the final analysis, I think the book's thesis that the word Imen or Amen is etymolog etymologically related to some form of the word in contemporary languages such as Akan is marred by spurious lookalikes and folk etymologies. These in turn betray a lack of knowledge of linguistics in general, as well as a lack of a, through a, a thorough understanding of the morphosemantics of the languages under study. In conclusion, in a world where so-called Afrocentric scholarship is under attack from a variety of quarters, the efforts of the authors in the origin of the word Amen, ancient knowledge the Bible has never told, may have actually provided detractors with ammunition by which to make their case that notwithstanding, the book will undoubtedly spark conversation. Further, hopefully, it will inspire other scholars to bring linguistics-based expertise to bear to, compre to comprehensively substantiate or debunk the arguments made in the book in the interest of restoring Ma'at truth to her rightful place, why Isafet wrong, wrongdoing, falsehood is driven away. Obadele Kambo, Editor-in-Chief, Ghana Journal of Linguistics, Senior Research Fellow, Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana. And then finally, you have um, some references. Hold on. See, references, James P. Allen, 2014, Middle Egyptian. That's the book that uh, the Ujjawi do plagiarize. And we'll have uh, Ernest Alfred, uh, Budge, uh, and so on. All those people, you know. There it is. So that's the end. So I can unshare. We have RP, who wrote Steel Watching. Thank you for being there, Senate. I hope you're doing well. And uh, I don't know if you were there from the beginning, but there's a part where we have several uh, Shenu, several Kartush. And uh, it's, it's a good exercise, you know, for every metal nature learners. And we know that you are one of them. We have your testimonial, even though it doesn't play in my outro, I made the outro before you made your testimonial. But for those who want to hear it, you have the, the playlist that says testimonial, metal nature class testimonial, you know, on my channel and the uh, Channel is there, but forever. Okay. So there is one sentence and I repeat that sentence. However, the numerous errors at every level mean that the book is in fact very dangerous for the audience for whom the book is intended. And this is a PhD talking, very dangerous. But we have some people who are known for being frauds, plagiarizers, liars. And there was a time 
when you will label them pseudos, and several people used to say, no, don't call them pseudos. After a while, they realized that indeed they were, and they themselves labeled them as such. But there was a time where people who are known for being frauds, for plagiarizing, for lying, you could not even call them pseudos. And those same people who are committing all those wrongdoing, all these isefet activities, they were comfortable. They were comfortable laboring many different individuals as being wrong, as having cooperation issues, and so on. And they went as far as saying that people like Sheikh Antadiop, Dr. Sheikh Antadiop, PhD, is wrong. And that he guessed. That's disrespectful. To say that he guessed because apparently you met someone who said, well, we're not sure about his word in Wolof. That's irresponsible. But it's all good. RP is asking, how do you sort from the legit and the illegitimate? Well, usually, if you read from PhDs, they're supposed to have methods. They're supposed to have ethics. They're supposed to have methodology. They're supposed to have skills, knowledge. But sometimes people can be PhDs and have all of the above, all of the aforementioned, but they venture into an area that they don't necessarily uh, master, that they're not necessarily uh, well-versed in. Sometimes it might be because they have a doctorate in, in, in a, um, what is it called again? Um, let me see what the website says again. A doctorate degree in divinity, you know? <laughs> African science is like, why are you not at work, Shaka? <laughs> well, let's say I'm not working today. <laughs> Are you worried that maybe I got fired? <laughs> no. Um... <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe because someone, you know, has, has a degree and, you know, it, I mean, he might, he might be a preacher. He might not be, but we have a lot of our people who are into this Abrahamic belief system, and sometimes if they can make a correlation with something that is in the Bible, with our story, our languages, then, you know, like, you know, you have some people who say, you know, the Fulanis are the Hebrews. You know? So some people used to be into the Abrahamic belief system, and they have not really detached themselves from it. Sometimes they might have detached themselves from it, but they're trying to appeal to the Abrahamic believers. Because that's where we have most people, and that's where the money is, in other words. So African science was just making sure you're not skipping work for YouTube. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Like if, if I didn't have children, you know, I might be that crazy. But you know, uh no, so, some people make major paper on YouTube, so they don't even have to do a nine to five. But no, I'm not I'm not skipping work for YouTube now. <laughs> nah. No, no, you know. So I finished reading the, this article by Combo. I know it would take some time. And I guess uh, maybe today I will uh, read um, the response. But it's not a good look. It's not a good look. And that's why it's important to be accurate. We don't have to be perfect, but to be accurate, you know. And sometimes for the neophytes, um, a lot of time neophytes will be attracted towards statements that are entertaining. 
rather than uh, statements that are metic meticulous because statements that are meticulous might be boring. But here we're not dealing with someone. Well, one doesn't have a PhD or didn't have a PhD at the time where he wrote the book. And as a matter of fact, if you read, now let, let me show you, let me show you. Because I think it's from the website. Now we have Jahi Isa PhD, you see? We, we've seen him, he's been online a few times, you know. There's a video of him where he's standing next to um, um, Shaka Ahmos. Shaka Ahmos is talking and then Dr. Jai is questioning him about Dr. Ben, you know, where what did Dr. Ben teach? Where did he teach which department? And Shaka Ahmos answered all those questions because Shaka Ahmos actually is, um, where am I not showing anymore? Uh, Shaka Amos' mother was very close to Dr. Ben. Shaka Amos himself was close to Dr. Ben. He knew him well. Um, so then Shaka Amos is like, you know, any other question? You know, then the, the conversation kind of went left. People had to diffuse the situation, but it's online. You know, if you type in, you know, you might find it. But anyway, I'm I'm not trying to start anything by saying that. Uh, that th there's there's some other videos of him. As a matter of fact, when Dr. Wesley Muhammad said that, um, uh, I forgot if he said black history degree or African history degree, but he said one of the two, something to that effect. He said it's BS degree, you know, bullsh degree. He 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 said, and I think he said that on the Breakfast Club. At the Breakfast Club, DJ Envy. Charlemagne the God and what's the lady's name? Um, Angela Yee. It's it's quite a popular program. So the radio alone is is um, has a large audience, and the YouTube channel as well has a large audience. And the Nation of Islam member, former advisor to Farrakhan, student minister, the one who said that milk is the food of the gods, the one who said that milk is liquid sunlight. The one who said, throw Kemet in a garbage can, throw Ahmed rather instead of making God away. Uh, he said, throw Kemet in a garbage can, throw Ma'at in a trash can, throw Ahmed rather instead of making God away. The same one who said that Malcolm X was bamboozled. Dr. Wesley Muhammad, PhD in Islamic study. The same one who said that when Nubia had to send 360 slaves every year to Muslim Egypt as determined in the Bakht agreement, it was a victory for the Nubians. The Nubians were the victors. They had the leverage and they determined the terms of the treaty. <laughs> so he said publicly that black history degrees are BS degrees, you know? And Dr. Jahi responded to that. And I can respect that, you know? I can respect that. I don't know if the video is still available, you know. So what we read when we go on the website of the book in question, he, oh, well, okay, uh, I missed that. I missed that. But that was a short stint. Well, let, let me read it all. Dr. Jai Hisa was born and raised in St. Louis County, Ferguson. He completed his undergrad, undergraduate degree, BA, in history at Texas Southern University. After a short stint at Emory University, Candler School of Theology, he earned both his MA and PhD from MHBCU Southern University and Howard University, respectively. So he had a short stint in a school of theology that might have, you know, influenced him somehow, some way, you know? And we are told that he is an editor with the Journal of Pan-African Studies and a leading scholar of, I'm sorry, on the diaspora, on the African diaspora, 
and history of Marcus Garvey and the UNIA in Louisiana and the American South while working at the scholar, I'm sorry, while working as the scholar in residence at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center for Pan-African Culture in Accra, Ghana, during the summer of 1998, he met Professor Osei and initiated a dialogue on how to make the book, The Origin of the Word Amen, accessible in the United States and the international community. Then we are told that he uh, traveled throughout Africa for over 25 years in various countries, such as Egypt, Ghana, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, Gambia, and Senegal, among others. He's a preeminent Africanist activist among his peers and is currently an adjunct faculty member at Medgar Evers College of the City, University of New York, Brooklyn, New York. So, Dr. Jahi, met Professor Osei in 1998. They talked about the book. And two years later, the book was released. Because if I'm not mistaken, the book was released in 2020. So it is safe to say that the majority of the claims, the main premise, comes from Osei, who is not the PhD out of the three authors slash editors you know so you have to be careful when you watch when you vouch for people particularly in academia when you are in a scholarly setting or environment you know and you know i know i know a fair bit of people sometimes they make claims i just don't agree with them and you know i try to be silent i try to be polite i don't want to just agree or not my head just because i know them or because i'm cool with them you have the right not to agree with people. And if you don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, then you can just remain silent. But if you vouch for someone verbally or in writing, you know, your credibility can take a blow, can be questioned uh, in, in the future. You know? So you read what Dr. Kambon said, that indeed we have enough people who criticize so-called Afrocentrics. We are criticized on a very uh, regular basis. As a matter of fact, a lot of Asiatic black men do criticize Afrocentrics. And Dr. Wesley Mohammed, PhD, once again, he made a wordplay. I see how the audio, I mean the video, he said, Afrocon, Afrocentrics, you know, trick. I'm tricking you. Con, C-O-N, he made that wordplay. He also came up with the term ghetto scholarship. You know, later on he tried to say, oh, I never said ghetto scholars, I said ghetto scholarship, but I have been on tables saying ghetto scholars, but it's all good, you know, it's all good. But many Afro-Asiatic black men, many Asiatic black men like to criticize Afrocentrics. Any Egyptologist, you know, they want you to say, I guess, that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and Gaddafi were black men. Then they'll be happy. They might want you to praise. Do I have it? I had it. Hold on. Hold on. I'll find it. I will find it. Bear with me. I will show you. I will show you. Now, it's going to be here. Ha ha. Let me share this. That's probably what they want us to do. And keep the comments going. I will, I, will, I will read them. I will go through them. Come on. I don't care too much about anything but Almighty God these days. Come on. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> Let's talk about this brother. Yes, sir. Come on. Because he's a bold man. That's right. Yes, he is. Let's talk about this brother. How did it look? 
Hey, Osama bin Laden. Yes, right. yes, Mr. Bin Laden. Gotta give him his respect. Got to. He's not bowing down hey, to this. Yes, I don't see him cutting the tap dance. Yes, right. dance. Yes, right. Hey, in the world, Mr. Bin Laden, stand yes, up. That's right. Oh, uh, there's a man born over in Arabia standing up and he's bringing reform right. uh, to this world, Mr. Bin Laden. Well, you're not supposed to say these things about him. <laughs> Come on with it. I thought I had free speech. <laughs> Come on. Mr. Bin Laden, Al Qaeda, the Taliban. I don't know whether Mr. Bin Laden had anything to do or not with the September 11th attacks. I don't know if I can trust these tapes that the government puts out. Come on. And they want you to hear the whole tape. Allegedly, where he confesses, but the other tapes that he puts out, you can't hear those. I don't know about believing in uh, the credibility of a government that puts out false information and knows how to fix up the videos. And That's right. With the tapes and check it out. That they're saying. I don't know how I can uh, trust J. Edgar Hoover's people. Come on. That's right. No there is a Muslim that is standing up. A right? Muslim, a true. And those who say he's not a Muslim, I have told him to please shut your mouth. That's right. Shut up. Because when Mr. Bin Laden speaks, he speaks from the Quran and the Sunnah. Right. And logic and reason. That's right. right. Those are his four points. Mm -hmm. The Quran, the Sunnah, the Hadith, mm -hmm. and what? Logic and reason. reason. <laughs> Let's give him a hand, man. Oh, oh, my God. God. That's good. That's good. Oh, That's good. God, God, God. 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 God is the great. Yeah. If the enemy hates him tangentially, That's right. logically, mathematically, he's your friend. That's right. Come on. Huh? Yeah. 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 If he got bush shook up, got him shook up. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. If he got bush shaking and quaking. Yes, he got Rumsfeld shaking and quaking. He got to be some kind of friend of yours or mine. Get out! Look okay, at what you say about him, man. His name will go down in history because he did not. Uh, he will not die a punk. That's right. 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 He, he will not die like some kind of sissy standing up. Right? That's right. In the name of God. In the name of God. Oh God. God is great. <laughs> Oh uh, man. So if we do that, they're happy. But if we call check on Tadi up, they're gonna criticize him. I mean, the guy who first came up with the hoax of a hieroglyphic of the arm meaning Allah, which was back in like 2008 slash 2009. Um in the comments, the conversation, and I've documented that. He went as far as saying that you know Dr. Ben and probably Dr. Clark as well were agents you know, paid by the government and, you know, on some sort of crusade against, you know, uh, Islam and stuff like that, you know. I mean, for some of them, if you talk about the sub-Saharan slave trade or the Arabo Muslim slave trade, they will label you as a hater of Islam immediately, you know, which is totally unfair. So some of them, that's what they want you to do, you know. They want you to, and, and, uh, um, Malik Zulu Shabazz is the one who said that Gaddafi was a black man. You know? Um, Booker T. Coleman, who now goes by another name, he's on tape. The, 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 the video is on, is on YouTube, I'm sure. I think he's dressed in, in yellow, has some yellow shirt or something like that. Uh, it's, it's, it's about the Moors. And at one point he said Saddam Hussein was an African man. Then recently we have some other people who said that uh, Osama bin Laden was melanated. So this is the mindset of Asiatic black men. The one who said that Saddam Hussein is melanated is Tohaka Bay, Moosh World TV. You know. So so that, when, you know I'm not I'm not making it up when I say Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, you know, and 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 um, and and Gaddafi. Those guys are black men according to Asiatic black men. You understand what I'm saying? So if you praise Osama bin Laden like that, now they're happy. But anyway, you know, that was just uh, in passing. Let me go through the comments. 
RP road, maybe it's an attempt to draw interest to African culture for black Christians. You know, I mean, there's no problem at all to draw the interest of Christians, not Christians, I'm sorry, Christians, non-Christians, Muslims, non-Muslims, Hebrews are like Jews, non-Hebrews are like Jews, atheists, um, Democrats, uh, Republicans, conservatives, people who don't vote, um, anybody. We just have to be accurate. We just have to be careful with the claims that we're making. Because the review that we went through or the critique is just not a good look for the authors of the book. You know, and the 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 part a man's hot EP. You know, hey, the, that's a bit of humor. It's a job, but when we look at the the, the method that that they use, it's not far fetched to say that it's an analogy, of course. They didn't claim that, but that their methodology, with their methodology, someone might be might want to claim that. They, they broke down metonature words and they, they, they dissected single metonature words. So we have James Power in the place to be. I hope you're doing well. RP said that the breakfast club should not be considered a serious information source ever. Well, um, my point is that they have a large platform, you know, and and let, let's keep it real. They have many different kind of people and, and surely some of the information that we have there, you know, will be correct. You know, some might not be correct. And as a matter of fact, I mean, even among, I mean, well, usually among PhDs, you know, they, 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 there's a certain level, you know, but they have a large platform. You know, if we had, you know, every now and then, or maybe once a comedic person that would come and talk about the med nature, it's a um, correlation with different African languages, the relationship with the rest of Africa. Um, or just talk about ancient black history in general, which is attested, which is documented, it will be great for us, you know. Now, on the Breakfast Club, they, you know, I mean, they, they, they prefer inviting, you know, Abrahamic believers and Asiatic black men. They have the right to invite whoever they want, you know. But uh, the, the, the comedic people, we don't really have, we, we, we are not reaching the mainstream. We are not. We are not. Now, po Polite went on the Breakfast Club accompanied with some uh, 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 NBA, uh, I think it was a basketball player. But um, polite, some people would say he's schematic. He would appear to be many schematic. But polite is, a, is, is also a diehard New Orleans, and New Orleans, at the end of the day, they are Moors, they are Moorish. So there's this issue of, you know, flipping properties. I mean, there's even a time when you talk about, you know, uh, what is it? I have a video somewhere, but he said like, you know, $50 property or something like that. You know, I had a video back then, you know, getting a property for like $50. But besides that, you don't know, you have the sovereignty, sovereignty stuff, you know, the uh, UCCs and all this stuff, you know, it's complicated stuff. Um, and, and, and different, you know, package and training about, you know, making money and you know i don't know if you touch on crypto money but of course there's this uh, very severe accusation for which he has not been incarcerated he, he's free he's rolling but lately i mean we've seen he's been he's been flossing he's been flashing a lot and i made a lot of people jealous but there's some activity that he could have you know really refrained from showing you know grinding on girls all the time you know it's not really necessary but he was just living his best life you know like you have the the pastor in brooklyn He's known for being flashy, and he was robbed at gunpoint, you know, live streaming, you know, and luckily nobody was hurt, you know, and he's, the, the pastor says that he doesn't make any money from the church, but he's actually 
I've heard a video of him uh, like a couple of days after the the robbery that took place in Brooklyn. And he was telling people that, you know, they can join his classes because he's teaching people how to flip houses. You know, so any occupation that he has, if it's legal, you know, more power to him. But he's known for being flashy, you know, and that attracts a lot of jealousy, a lot of hate, a lot of envy. And 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 uh, and Polite did that, and a lot of people questioned the, if if all the different houses that we used to see in him was really his houses. There's a lot of questions that were raised. But at the end of the day, I don't want to you know talk too much. I, I was just I just mentioned Polite to say that you know he was on a breakfast breakfast club, and he will be considered comedic by many. But besides that, we don't really have comedic people on large platforms, you know. And I'll be very happy if if it ever happens, you know. You know, so if that was to be Jabari, that would be a good look for all comedic people. And the only thing, you know, the brother Jabari, the only thing that I would, I would recommend that he does, and he is, he's probably older than me. I ain't trying to act like I want to tell him what he needs to do. This is like really a friendly advice. He does have to take my advice. He's his own man. He's a master of his destiny. He's a, he's a, he's a leader of his organization. He has a large audience, way larger than than my audience, you know. But please, brother Jabari, please. You can take two weeks or one month, and 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 study the med nature at at a, at a, um, uh, like very thoroughly, you know. In, in two weeks to one month, you know. And I mean. <laughs> I don't want to say I give you classes for free, you know, but you could get there easily and it won't be an issue no more. It won't take long. It will not take long. And then you will not have this criticism anymore and we will be able to keep it pushing. You will be more comfortable when you're faced with artifacts. You'll be more comfortable when you're faced with somebody else because, you know, there was this discussion with the brother Tahuti. You know, uh, but anyway, I digress. I digress. You know, so eventually, maybe one comedic person, you know, that's that's familiar with the culture and the language, will ultimately be on one of those uh, platforms, and it will be a good look for all of us. You know, I wish that would happen, because so far the reality is that many people slander us and make fun of us, and you know, say all sorts of, of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just it's not pleasant. <laughs> People are really dissing us hard, man. When we are the one with the artifacts, you know. Uh, people wrote, I read a couple of books on 911 and Bin Laden. He might not have done the towers, but he still is one to extol. I call it a beheaded and innocent man. I don't think they beheaded only one innocent man. But um, oh, it's probable that, you know, him or Al-Qaeda didn't have anything to do with the, the towers, you know. I'm sure many of us have seen 911 loose change, you know, and there's plenty of other documentaries as well. You know, the free fall, a bit strange for such a well-built structure, you know. Uh, but then again, you know, if we talk about that, they're gonna label us conspiracy theorists, you know what I'm saying? And and there's enough um firefighters and policemen and um white people who actually touch on that topic. So we can let them do their things. We already have so much stigma, you know what I'm saying? Apparently they were trying to come up with some new laws of like like black, black supremacists and stuff like that. So, you know, there's enough people, you know, goody, Miss Goody Two Shoes and, you know, square dudes who actually touch on that. So, you know, we can let them continue, you know. Different different experts, you know, people presenting themselves as ep experts on constructions and, you know, um, engineering who actually touch on who actually, you know, stated their piece about the whole situation of 9/11, uh, particularly the towers, and we, 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 I'm sure many have seen the footage of the Pentagon when the, the, the actual ceiling collapsed. You know, it did not collapse after the collision, right after the collision of a plane, and it should be surprising that a plane will leave such a small hole uh, against when it crashed against a building. But you know, I will leave it there once again. I don't want to be labeled, you know, conspiracy theorist. I don't want another one this channel to be flagged. Of this video to be flagged, that was just in passing, you know what I'm saying? 
people can just have a look at 911 loose change i think it's a great summary uh of of the of the whole thing you know so now it's been two hours you know um One moment. Okay, so it's been two hours. I went through all the comments. Thank you for being there. For those who don't know, I'm giving mental nature classes. It's ten dollars for an hour, which is very affordable. Other people will charge. Um, it's very affordable. Other people will charge you fifty dollars for an hour. Other people will charge you like sixty hours and more. I'm sorry, sixty hours, sixty dollars or more for an hour. Um, those who are interested can contact me. You have the email address in the description of this video. If you have not seen the video called Kemet and Maad, then then by all means do so. It's the main video of my channel, which once again is Maad Forever, all in one word. Um, thank you, Senet. Short peace to you and the family. Um, I also recommend that you watch the video entitled Deception of Asiatic Black Men and the other one called White Semites Black Awakening. If you want to have a, a short version, you have the video called Black Semites Shocking Revelation. But that's just an appetizer, you know. The Semites were not black. The people of Canaan, Canaan Arabia, Mesopotamia, Sumeria, Sumer, Akkad, the Levant, the Near East, the Middle East, they are white slash Caucasian, pale skin, and we have their artifacts throughout many different periods of time, starting from the standard of ore, which is dated 2500 BCE, 4,500 years ago. The standard of ore is located in the British Museum, London, England. I didn't dig it up. I did not date it. It's the British Museum. And we have plenty of other artifacts of these inhabitants of the uh, regions that I have mentioned. But many of our people feel like, you know, uh, during this time period, from 2500 BC to our recent time, it has been black people all over. Now, maybe 20,000 20, BC, 50,000 BC, 100,000 BC, maybe there were black people there. I don't deal with that kind of dates, you know. So the fact that from 2500 BC, basically 2500 BC, the inhabitants of these areas uh, were not black, that kills any argument or any claim for my beloved brothers and sisters to tell you that you know the patriarchs of the Bible and the Quran used to be black. You know, there are many doing linguistic acrobatics and linguistic gymnastics. You know, so you don't have to take my word for it. The different artifacts that I show, I did not dig them up. You know what I'm saying? And 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 really, you have the, the depiction of Beni Hassan, where we can see some Asiatics, most likely some Canaanites. You know, that 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 one here is, is painful for the people who claim blackness of the Jews slash Hebrews slash Canaanites. It's very painful because you do see those Asiatics um, painted along with the Egyptian, and you can clearly see the difference. And you have other depictions of these Asiatics, you know. So stay safe, stay healthy. And if I'm allowed to by the nature, I will definitely holler back at you. Once again, you can learn the Bandu nature. You can be familiar with it. Don't be like those who are chemetic and who have been chemetic for like 15 years and they can barely read two glyphs. You don't have to be like them. You know, you can learn. You can definitely learn. That civilization of Kemet is beautiful. Some people vilify Kemet and insult Kemet and chemetic people. Some even insult the Bandu nature. We have a few people who say, F the Madu nature. I'm like, <laughs> why out of all the languages in the world would they say F the Madu nature, but they never said F any other language? And those are black people, man. Those are black people, man. I'm telling you. So stay safe, stay healthy. And if I'm allowed to by the nature, I will definitely holler back at you, hotel. Now, for the record, for those who don't know, I'm giving Madu nature classes. And here, that's the flyer, okay? So, those who are interested, feel free to holler at me. If you're not interested, it's cool. But I recommend everybody 
I recommend that everybody who has not yet seen the video Kemet and Ma'at before Judaism, Christianity and Islam, then watch it. It has about 300,000 views and really deserves to have a lot more. I just want to let everyone know who's gonna, who's, who's gonna, uh, who's listening now and who's going to listen to this, uh, this, uh, stream in the future. I just had a, my first Metanetia class by Brother Shaka today, and I've had other, uh, Metanetia lessons by other teachers, and I can tell you right now, the brother is the best in the game he is uh that that was one of the best classes i've ever had ever so if you're interested in learning the meta nature if you're interested in getting the basics of it brother shaka is an awesome teacher get with him and it's extremely affordable this brother is giving us his time and his skills and he's basically giving it away. I mean, I, you know, I just consider it a donation. You know what I'm saying? So if anybody is interested in learning about the nature, get with this brother right here. He's an awesome, awesome, awesome teacher. And I'll end with that. Hotep Senu, Hena Senut. This is Julie, also known as Servant of Yah. And I'm currently taking the Medunetra classes with Brother Shaka. And it has been an amazing experience only two lessons so far and I feel like um, I've been taking the classes for months just with the uh, how in depth he goes into the vocabulary words, um, the construction of the language, the grammar. Um, it's been immeasurable, um, the experience. And one thing that comes across hands down is his uh, extreme passion for teaching this to anyone who is willing to learn and has a, a, an interest in learning. So I highly suggest um, if you are interested, even a minimal interest, that uh, you subscribe to the classes with Brother Shaka. Um, it's such a nominal amount for how much you get. Uh, I know like our last class was uh, over two and a half hours. It felt like two minutes, but because that's how you know, involved you are in what he's teaching and how he teaches and how compassionate he is about what he teaches. Um, also with sharing materials free of charge, uh, no question, no doubt. Um, it's just what he does. He doesn't have to, but he does. And so I just wanted to give a short testimonial um, about the class and the effectiveness of the class. And uh, all of that is attested to uh, how studied Brother Shaka is. Uh, so I highly recommend anyone with a minimal interest that you do sign up for the Medunetia class. Hotep. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, which is Ma'at Forever. Don't forget to watch the video entitled Kemet and Ma'at. Don't forget to share Kemet and Ma'at on my channel on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, or other social media that you use. Email, text messages, you name it. Those who wish to donate can do so on paypal.me slash maatforever.